How's everybody today? Sounds like a mixed bag. Uh, just before I launch into the message this morning, uh, we get to enjoy uh, serving in pastoral roles and ministries here. We're very grateful for that. And um, one of the things that really makes that possible is just the incredible number of people who volunteer their time and use their talents and their abilities to serve our church family well. And that allows us to do things that that are, are more pastoral in nature. So I'd like us, before we go any further, could you just give a round of applause to all the people who serve here and make everything possible that we do? It's hard to believe we're already seven weeks into the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, uh, last week, uh, Jonathan did a phenomenal job introducing us to a concept of discipleship that is not just about following Jesus, but also introducing other people to Jesus. Jesus tells uh, Simon Peter, he says, uh, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This idea that we're not just believing certain things, but we're inviting other people to participate in that as well. And then the way the, the chapter ends in chapter four, it says this, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all those who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed and he healed them and large crowds from Galilee, uh, the Decapolis, which is a, a, a network of 10 towns, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Every disease and illness was being cured and healed by Jesus. And, and there was a phrase in there that talks about pain and then it talks about demon possessed. And, and a lot of modern people will just say, well, that's what they used to refer to when there was an illness that they couldn't understand what caused it or why a person reacted the way they did. And, and so people who had seizures, they would just be considered demon possessed. But that's not true. And the scripture shows us here. It says those who were demon possessed and those who had seizures they actually had a capacity to make a distinction that I think in our modern world we're probably not as good at. And so uh, all these people are coming to him, and this is what's fascinating now. He's got these huge crowds, Jesus does, that are coming to him. And this is where we launch chapter five. It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, what did he do? He went up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him. And he began to teach them. He's talking to the disciples now. By the end of the Sermon on the Mount, large crowds will have gathered around and he's including them in the conversation. But it's starting with the conversation to his disciples. He had performed these miracles and these healings and now people start coming. Is he changing his model of ministry? Is he just going to a teaching model now? Now that he's got the crowd. And that's not what's happening here. Jesus is not abandoning ministry of healing. He actually wants to expand the ministry of healing. One person can only do so much. So he wants to help his disciples learn how to see those who are suffering and learn how to serve them so that the ministry of healing can be expanded. And he launches into something called that we refer to as the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes can be broken down, I think, into three categories. And the first category is the category of people who are suffering. Life is not easy or kind to them. And then there's the servers, people who are trying to often to help people who are suffering. And then there's the persecuted, people who when you do the right thing, you often experience a negative consequence for it. So let's take a look at some of these this morning. And the first lesson we're going to look at is that Jesus blesses those who suffer. Jesus has a blessing for people who suffer. If we can see, G or see people the way Jesus sees them, then we'll see the opportunity to be able to minister to them. Jesus wants his followers to be kind of antibodies, antibiotics in the culture in which we live. The goal is for us to be a resource of healing to our world. Uh, the Bible talks about how blessings and cursings cannot come from the same mouth. 
And so we need to be people who are blessed because how many know there's not a shortage of the cursors in our world? Like they've, they've got it covered, all right? So these blessings are available to people not because they've earned them or achieved them. It's because they need them. And just think about that. Because I suspect there are people in this room right now who don't feel like you've earned or achieved anything, but you desperately need something from God. So the Beatitudes actually show us how to see people who are suffering differently. This is what it starts with. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. These are people who are experiencing devastating situations. The poor in spirit, there's no confusion about what's wrong in their life. They have crystal clarity about the things that they don't have. And Jesus isn't asking them to pretend and put on a happy face and pretend like everything is good and we'll call that faith. Jesus doesn't play those games. He's not asking them to pretend anything, but he's telling them there's a blessing for people who are experiencing poverty and who suffer from it. He's not describing a blessing, he's delivering one. The poor are completely dependent on others to survive. They know that. If they don't have help, they're not going to make it. They've come to the conclusion, not just I don't have enough, but they've come to the conclusion, I am not enough. They're poor in spirit. They feel like failures. And Jesus has a blessing for them. <laughs> How many are glad Jesus has a blessing for people who don't feel like they've earned anything? It's phenomenal. Even in the Old Testament, we see the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians and, and, and their days were long and their toil was uh, very difficult and, and they didn't have any days off and, 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 and they were beaten when they didn't meet certain quotas and, and all they could do is cry out in pain. They hadn't earned anything. They didn't deserve anything. And yet God rescued them out of that situation. Why? Because this is the kind of God we're dealing with. Isn't that great? So what is the blessing for them? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus saying to them? The kingdom of heaven exists for you and consists of you. Yours is the kingdom. It's amazing how powerful an influence that can be. You're in a bad situation, but that does not mean you are excluded from being blessed. Blessings are not just for the winners in life. They're available because of your losses in life. A blessing for those who have suffered loss. Blessed are those who mourn. They're grieving. They know what it is to have deep grief and pain in their lives. Their hearts have been broken. For them, grief is not just an occasional intruder. It's a constant companion. If you're suffering loss, there's a blessing for you. It's comfort. This is interesting to me because Jesus did not say that the blessing is all of the grief and sorrow and sense of loss will go away. He says that in the midst of all of that, you will be comforted. And then there's a blessing for the meek. Who are they? They are those who make no claims for themselves. They feel like they have no power in life. They're not warriors. They don't fight for things, especially not for themselves. Jesus was actually an example of this when he was on trial. He made no claim to his rights and he made no effort to assert himself. And so what happens to people like this? How, does, how do people like this, how should we see them? And if you feel powerless, then you should know Jesus has a blessing for you. One day there's going to be a great reversal and it's not just heaven that you'll enjoy, but there are things in earth that you will be able to enjoy. That the earth doesn't just yield its fruit and its treasures to people who know how to shake things up and move things by the effort of their own wills. That there's a blessing for those who feel powerless. A blessing for those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Righteousness is something of a relational term. Um, it is to be in right relationship with God 
and to be in right relationship with others. It's not just doing right things. It's doing right things in a way that fosters healthy relationship with God and with other people. It promotes healthy relationships. That, that's how the concept is in scripture. Now, what it says here, he doesn't say blessed are those who are righteous. He said blessed are those who are starving for righteousness. They understand they don't have it. Their relationships aren't working out. Jesus didn't say the righteous are blessed. He said those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. We know you can only live so long without food. You can live even less time without water. But we forget sometimes that we, we have trouble surviving in an environment where it feels like nothing is right for us. One of the great challenges in our culture is suicidal ideations where people, because things aren't right, they don't think they can make it in this world. And I know that there's people in this room and watching right now, you know what that's like. Now, we're going to find out in Matthew chapter six that Jesus talks about where you start in seeking righteousness is you seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first, and then other things start falling into place. But I want you to hear that Jesus knows what it's like when people say, it is not right that I can't have healthy relationships in my life. It's not right that I never seem to get a break. It is not right that life never seems to work out for me. If that's true of you, you should listen to Jesus because Jesus says there's a blessing for you. There's a blessing for you you will be filled. And as I said, in the next chapter, Jesus will talk about seeking first God's kingdom. So that's how we're to see people who are suffering. Not as people who need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps or have made a series of choices and they're just living out the consequences of those choices and so they deserve it. When we see suffering people, see them this way. If we're going to be agents of healing, we can't be agents of judgmentalism. How do you see people? See them this way. And then there's lessons. Jesus blesses those who serve. It says in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. A blessing for the merciful. Who is this? It's someone who is able to experience the sadness of others. Like when they see others who are sad or who are broken, they can't be happy about that. They actually experience a sense of grief for themselves. Now, there's, a, there, um, there's two times that Jesus is going to use a quote out of the uh, prophet Hosea in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was uh, having dinner with Matthew, who wrote this book, uh, this letter, uh, this epistle, or not epistle, it's a gospel. And, and he, he invited a lot of his friends who were tax collectors. And so they were considered out of bounds people. They were marginalized people. They were the people you were not supposed to hang around with. They were considered a bad influence. And Jesus eats with them. And he, has a, he, has, he spends time with them. And the Pharisees were very upset about that. And this is what Jesus said. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. Go and learn what this means. And then he quotes Hosea. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go and learn what that means. There is a way, please hear this, there is a way to practice our faith that actually hardens our heart and makes us more severe in our dealings with others. And we feel like we're doing the right things. But what we're actually doing is becoming very hard. There's no mercy. The merciful have a way of seeing someone else's troubles as though it were their own. And they, they don't use that as a reason to step back. And by the way, people who are merciful often go through troubles of their own. And they don't use that as a reason to not be merciful to someone else. The other place that Jesus uses this quote is in Matthew chapter 12. 
and his disciples were going through the fields, fields of grain, and it was on a Sabbath day, and they were hungry, and they picked up some of the, the, the grain, and they ate it. And the Pharisees were all put out about that because they were, they were doing this on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus, once again, makes this reference to Hosea. He, tells, he reminds them of a story. David, who was Israel's second king and one of Israel's greatest kings, was being uh, 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 run down by Saul. It was a, a just maniacal individual, something of a narcissist and highly insecure, and he saw David as a threat. And he, he used every means available to him to try to end David's life. David winds up going into a, a place, a, a holy place, and there's bread, and it's called consecrated bread, and it's only for the priest to eat. But he and his men ate that bread. And everybody understood that was okay because they were starving and they were being unfairly prosecuted and persecuted by the king of Israel at that time who was Saul. So they understood what that was. And Jesus reminds them of this story. And he says, everybody knows that it was okay for them to eat that bread. He said, you need to remember the phrase, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. And what is he saying? Don't use some kind of religious rule as a reason to keep food from hungry people. Blessed are the merciful. What happens? They receive mercy. This is fascinating. Mercy is not just my response is gratitude. Mercy is my response is generosity. I have received mercy from God. I want to share mercy with others. Then there's a blessing for the pure in heart. Well, what does that mean? Pure in heart actually gets to some of our motives. Uh, some people do things not just to help, but to be seen helping. Anybody know anybody like that? You don't raise your hand. You might be sitting next to them. Uh, here's an example. Some people date someone not because they love the person and not because they think they have a future with the person. They're just using them as a placeholder. They don't like being alone. And so they'll be in a relationship, but they're on the lookout for a better option. And then as soon as that better option comes along, then they'll exit this one. Would you call that a, a pure motive in the relationship? Not so much. There are people who will use other people and organizations to get the attention that they crave while they pursue their own agenda. That's not pure in heart. Jesus is looking for people whose heart is clear. They're not clouded or confused by other motives. For those that are focused on God and his agenda, this is what the blessing is. You see God. What does that mean? Does that mean like suddenly you, you see God in the room? And I think what it means, that could happen, and we're certainly going to see God someday, but I think what it actually means is you see God in the details of how you're serving others in life, how he puts things together, how he opens doors, how he gives the strength and the energy you need, how he makes resources available. I think that's what he's talking about. So there's a blessing. There's also a blessing for peacemakers. I think our culture could just pay a little bit of attention to this particular part of Jesus' message. By the way, in Scripture, peacemaking is not just the absence of conflict. We're going to stop the fighting. Peacemaking has, a, it has to do with a concept of wholeness and well-being. It's, it's not just stopping conflict. What it is is it's bringing community. That's what peacemaking is. It, it brings reconciliation. And what happens when, what's the blessing for that? If you're a person who, you don't just want to stop fighting, you actually want people to be able to, to interact with each other and benefit from that interaction. What, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say about that? He said, you'll be called God's children. There's a lot of people who think that they're God's children and they actually promote division. That's not how heaven sees it. So that's the lesson for the servers. That's why they're blessed. And then a lesson that you should expect to be persecuted. Uh, verse 10 says, 
Uh, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You probably heard that phrase on the first beatitude, right? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There's a blessing here for the persecuted. There are people who are oppressed and they are abused for righteousness sake. Remember, righteousness is about right relationship with God and with others. If you prioritize your relationship with God and you prioritize your relationship with others, you can be treated with hostility by people who have a different set of motives and agendas. When you don't agree with the hate that's in our world, you will be hated. When you are not corrupted by the corruption in our world, people will despise you. When you try to help others up, there are people in this world that will want to put you down or take you down. There will always be voices that are critical of those who see suffering and want to bring blessing to it. Look for ways to serve those who are going through it. And the accusations, I wish I had time to talk about all the things that can be said. But the point is, is that there's a blessing for people who are persecuted. And then Jesus says this, people who bless and people who serve actually make a difference. If you see people who suffer this way, and you're willing to serve this way, and you don't give up when people mistreat you because of it, Listen to what he says. You are the salt of the earth. If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What is he saying here? You're the salt of the earth. He's not saying we should be salty. How many, how many know some salty people? If you don't know, that's a reference to people who get a little bit ornery and resentful when they don't get what they want in life or they lose something that they thought belonged to them. Jesus is not saying, you be salty people. We have enough of them too already, all right? Be salt. What, what is the job of salt? Well, salt doesn't exist for itself. The purpose is, in to, is to interact with food. Disciples are not just to exist the followers of Jesus don't just exist for ourselves. We're supposed to interact with the world around us. Salt penetrates food. Followers of Jesus are to penetrate our world. When we live to separate ourselves from others, we actually become useless. That salt has no more purpose. We're not to segregate ourselves from the world. We're here to influence the world. And then he says this, you are the light of the world. When you find your worth and your identity and your security in Jesus, you will shine in this world. You just live differently. It frees you to do not just good works, but to do them in a different kind of way. You're not trying to earn something from God or earn something from others. You're not trying to prove something to God or prove something to others. You're actually responding out of the generosity of God. And that kind of living allows you to do, to do good deeds in a very different kind of way. What is that? You find yourself becoming transparent. Then instead of people noticing what you are doing, they start noticing God. That's a very powerful way to live. Our goal is to act in ways. Think about this. Our goal is to act in ways that help others see God more clearly. Now, in chapter 6, Jesus goes into a whole thing about do not do your good works before men so that they can, you can be seen by them. That's not the goal. The goal is for people to see God more clearly. Uh, I'm going to ask worship team to come out. And by the way, don't get confused. This is just one person today uh, for time purposes. I'm going to ask the worship person to come out. 
Maybe, maybe Jesus is not calling us to imitate the categories of people he identified in his Beatitudes. Maybe he's just reminding the people surrounding him that they're not excluded from blessing because of what they're going through. Maybe what Jesus is doing is recklessly, generously throwing blessings about. Those who are sick, those who choose not to retaliate against things done to them in life, those who go to bed hungry at the end of the day, those who are unnoticed and undervalued and underappreciated, the people who try to make things work out instead of tear things down, a blessing for you, a blessing for you, a blessing for you. If your faith feels weak, there's a blessing for you too. If you've been wounded, you feel defensive, a little bit jaded, may be suspicious, Jesus has a blessing for you too. For those who have nothing to give, who feel like they're too old or too young or too whatever, the God of heaven is with you. The Spirit of Jesus blesses you. Blessed are the people who hold things and keep things together. Blessed are those who cry themselves to sleep at night. Blessed are the ones that no one sees and experience incredible loss. And blessed are those that feel forgotten. And blessed are those who are wrongly accused. Blessed are the ones that life is so hard for them. Jesus surrounds himself with people like you, and you are blessed. You are. those who feel burned out, those who still care, nobody can figure out why, those who know they need forgiveness, blessing, blessing, blessing. So I want to provide a blessing for you today. Maybe you're in a situation that you could define or describe as suffering. Maybe you're in a situation today where you're trying to serve others. Maybe you're in a situation today where because you're trying to do the right thing, you're experiencing hard things and painful things. If any of those things are true about you today, would you just stand right now? Because Jesus has a blessing for you. Now for all of you that are sitting would you please find someone and just extend your hand? This is the posture of blessing. It's holy people lifting their hands without wrath, without resentment, to release the blessings of God on those that are here. So Father, right now we bless those who are going through difficult and painful times, those who feel like they don't have enough and are not enough, those who are going through physical challenges and emotional challenges. They may be even going through spiritual challenges. Right now, we ask that you would add your blessing to their life. For those who are serving, not because they want attention. For those who are serving, not because they're trying to earn points or get ahead. They just want to help someone who's in need. We ask you to add your blessing to their lives. And for those who've tried to do the right thing, but because of that, there are people who see them differently and actually want to add pain into their lives. We add your blessing to them in the name of Jesus. So Father, let your blessing rest upon them. Let your hand be extended to them. We ask that you would give them strength, that you would give them your peace, and you would encourage their hearts. And we ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. And everyone who agreed with that blessing said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.